from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Superstitious Ignorance by Michael Cornish Edward tapped his gloved fingers on the leather-covered steering wheel. He stared through the glistening windscreen at the sheen on the bonnet, then at the square houses running away in the half-darkness of the seedy street beyond. The squat bonnet gleamed with 20th century superiority over the peeled and grimy facades of the 18th century villas to either side of the street. The decayed facades were too ingrained with grime to benefit from the charm of the gaslight. The original Victorian gaslights had survived in that area, which was usually as flattering to such architecture as nightclub light to female complexions. Georgian, I'd say, Edward said. Definitely Georgian. His wife Penny stirred beside him in the passenger seat. The big collar of her fawn cashmere coat was turned up, and it pushed out her honey blonde hair a little, but attractively, nevertheless. Looking attractive was quite natural to her, and not something studied. The coat, which she had been able to buy at a knockdown price from the people she modeled it for, looked marvelous against the black leather upholstery of the Mini Cooper. Yes, Penny said, but my God, look at it. Oh, do try to use your imagination, darling, Edward said excitedly. Just think, a detached Georgian house with a large garden at the back, eight big rooms and hall. Think of what we could make of it. Penny pulled her coat tightly about her, which he resented a little because there was an excellent heater in the car, and until he recognized that it was an instinctive defense measure against coming to this down-at-heel area at all. He knew very well in his heart she'd be happy to spend all her life in flats in Chelsea, frittering away their modest lump of capital, and that it was only her determination to be a good wife that had steeled her to coming with him in the first place. I didn't like that estate agent, darling, Penny said nervously. He did seem so well shifty and vague, too, in such a seedy little office. Edward laughed indulgently. It made him both exasperated and affectionate to remember that she was still a sucker for any smart exterior, though he'd been quietly trying to open her eyes to the real world for all the eighteen months he'd known her. Oh, come now, Penny, my love. He was quite a nice man, really. Quite a fine sense of humor, if you listen for it. Did you hear how he described negotiating with the little people who own property in this area? Like dealing with a tank full of eels, he said. He saw that she wasn't ready to be cajoled out of her nervousness and put his arm around her. Now, darling, just this one house tonight. It shouldn't take more than half an hour. Then we can go back, and seeing that it's Friday night, I'll take you to dinner in the Roman room. There, what about that? She turned her face to him. Her eyes showed a mixture of contrition and delight. Now that he'd mentioned her favorite place, he kept on smiling though deep down he was a bit irritated with her for making him resort to such extravagant bribery. Besides, he said, it's just because that estate agent is so clueless that he hasn't seen the potential of this area yet. It stands to reason areas like this, only three or four stops on the tube from the West End, must come up. People can't go on paying more and more astronomical prices for houses around the smarter areas and the rail fares and so on are already driving the long-distance commuters back into town. He knew it was all so much repetition, but it seemed to be the only way to do it. And what's more, Penny, remember those houses that been done up so nicely in the terrace just back around the corner? It's already happening, you see. We just can't afford to miss a chance like this. We'd kick ourselves forever about it if we did. Just for a moment, he saw in his mind's eye the house as it might be. The stucco restored round the windows and the classic door. The door itself could be a natural wood, with coach lamps setting off its delicate balanced grace. Penny, in the very latest evening gown, 
She'd surely pick up something just right from her modeling, as she always did, in the doorway welcoming the astonished and admiring first-comers to their housewarming. Penny smiled, the sweetest of her private smiles for him, and he knew the enthusiasm that had been in his voice had rekindled her support. Oh, Teddy, darling, I know you're right. It's just me again. You know, you're not to mind. He kissed her tenderly and then opened the door and got out to make the most of it before her mood faltered. He took his big torch out of the side pocket in the door just in case and then went round to help her out. He shut the door after her briskly, enjoying again the solid musical clunk as the well-made panel fitted as smoothly into place as a folded wing to a falcon's back. The sound of their feet on the road, then on the pavement, then on the five shallow steps to the front entrance to the house, were the only noises to be heard in the quiet and deserted street, only the light shining dimly here and there through the cheap curtains in the windows of some of the houses, and the old second-hand cars parked intermittently along the roadside showed that the area was inhabited at all. The porch light was broken, of course, so the elegant shape of the stucco beneath its peeling, sooty surface paint offered only a sense of desolation and unwelcome now as he groped about with gloved fingers and eyes for signs of a bell. Eventually he found it and pressed it. There was no answering noise from his side, no sound at all. Penny's patent leather high-heeled shoes glistened as she moved her feet apprehensively to any position. It's extraordinary, though, that it should be going so cheap if it's as much of a find as you say, she said quietly as though someone might be listening. It does seem, well, fishy. He laughed briskly, establishing the masculine no-nonsense note on which they had to see the thing through. He found a door knocker, obviously a pleasing bit of brass, beneath these caked layers of ancient black paint, and banged it sharply several times. Do you think anyone's there, Penny said. I don't think the place is occupied after all. Of course there's someone there. The estate agent said there was a sitting tenant, and sitting tenants don't run out unless there's a very good reason. A woman, I think, he said, with some kids. There was still no sound from inside. The point is, Penny, darling, for three thousand pounds this place is a snip, sitting tenant or no sitting tenant. Besides, I'm sure we can winkle her out in no time if we pay her a few hundred to move, and we'll easily be able to do that if we can get this for only three thousand pounds. At that moment there was a startling grinding of bolts behind the door, and it swung open to present them with a gust of moist and fetid air that was obviously being changed for the first time in months, and a small, squat woman in an unspeakably filthy apron. Her face was primitive and olive-skinned. Her eyes, so far as Edward could tell in the miserable light of the thirty-watt bulb in the hall behind her, were dark and hot with an unfathomable mixture of suspicion, hostility, and imperviousness. Her hair was black and parted in the middle, then heaped in an untidy bun at the back of her head. It looked as if it had never been washed, ever. Good evening, Edward said firmly in his best junior management tone. Mrs. Laristi? The woman didn't reply. She watched them as though they were some sort of distant passing show. My name is Grafton, and this is my wife. I hope Mr. Faithwell at the estate agents told you we were coming round tonight to look at the house. I gather you know it's up for sale. Mrs. Laristi spoke at last in a deep, hoarse voice. Mr. Fedwell, yes. He's been here some time, two weeks ago, maybe. He says something or other, I don't know. She shrugged, pulling her lips down at the corners. He decided a firm lead would be the thing to make up for Faithwell's inefficiency. There was no point in letting it go now, as it would be no end of a job getting Penny back here another time. He stepped into the hall past the woman, smiling politely but firmly, and saying, Well, we'll be very quick, I promise you, Mrs. Laristi. We'll disturb you as little as possible. It was then that he noticed a string of kids standing silently behind her. There were four of them, and they were all disgustingly filthy. Some had their fingers stuffed in their messy mouths. Some worked nervously at the dirty garments at their groins. All stared at him and Penny with their mother's dark-eyed, complex stare. He took Penny's arm into his to show their solidarity and looked round the hall, taking in as much as the great plague of shadows left by the thirty-watt bulb would allow. The hall was beautifully proportioned and focused naturally 
on the swing of the staircase at the end in spite of the peeling wall paint and the hideously blistered and ancient green paint all over the place. The floor was well laid and seemed sound. It's no good, this house, Mrs. Larissi said. She shook her head. Bad spirits. Bad spirits? Penny repeated, then blinked at Edward for support. I think we'll look in this room first, Edward said dismissively for answer to both of them. Somehow the Laristi brood infiltrated past him to stand in a body in front of the door. Is our room, Mrs. Laristi said. It's for us, for living. It's private. Look, Edward said reassuringly, we won't steal anything or even touch anything. We only want a quick look to see the shape of the room and whether it's structurally okay. You must be sensible, Mrs. Laristi. The more fuss you make, the longer it will take and the longer we'll be here. Mrs. Laristi watched them for a moment, and then shrugged and opened the door, then switched on the dim light. She had been telling the truth. What had presumably once been the kitchen for the whole house was the only room her family apparently used. The old-fashioned iron range built into the wall round the fireplace was in a state of unutterable squalor. The room stank bitterly of urine and filth. There was one massive bed, in which presumably all of them slept with soiled bedclothes gray and shiny with dirt heaped on it. Clothes and papers and empty and half-empty food containers lay heaped in what remaining space there was. Two cheap wooden chairs were the only other pieces of furniture in the room. Three or four mangy fox-faced cats suddenly shot from under the bed and out between the legs to disappear somewhere into the house. Yes, Edward said, I thank you. I think we've seen enough of that room. It's becoming a little more obvious why it's only 3,000, Penny muttered to him breathlessly. She had been holding her breath in Mrs. Laristi's room. Edward walked across to the other side of the hall and reached for the handle of the nearest door, glad that he had kept his gloves on, and thinking that there was no future in playing too much deference to the woman because she didn't own the place anyway. But Mrs. Laristi suddenly moved with unexpected speed to push past in front of him, reeking of old cooking grease and bodily staleness. Ah, Dios, wait, wait for other rooms. First it must be done, it must be done. She rolled her eyes upward, crossed herself, and muttered on while she went through a series of genuflections and then some weird and distinctively pagan-looking gestures in front of the door. To Edward's amazement, all the children imitated her movements as best they could behind her. How depressing, Penny said weakly beside him. She had turned her head a little so that her nose was against the big turned-up cashmere collar. He squeezed her waist to reassure her. When she had finished, Mrs. Laristi opened the door fearfully and peered hesitantly beyond, as though it might at any moment be necessary to bolt. Edward stepped in after her and switched on the light, which once again proved to be a bare thirty-watt bulb. There was nothing unpleasant to see in the room beyond its dirtiness. Obviously it wasn't even used now, and it stank of cats. Otherwise there were some old and rotted armchairs, a bare iron bed frame and a lot of old newspapers and magazines, and empty cans scattered about. Presumably, when the chaos became too much in her room, she simply shifted the excess in here. Edward made himself miss all this and see the potential of the beautiful casement windows at either end. Above, he saw to his delight, there was a fine molded ceiling that certainly looked as though it was the work of real craftsmen and was more or less intact apart from the dirt. There's a sort of art in the middle of the room to indicate that it could be used as two if necessary, and fine wood fireplace surrounds in each section. His heart leaped with new resolution about the house as he went out. Yes, he said, rubbing his gloved hands together. And now let's move on. Shall we see the room opposite? Mrs. Laristi burst into speech again. This house no good, not glad, is evil presence, is old evil thing, maybe murder, I don't know. Very evil things live here, no good for you. I'm afraid ghosts are allergic to me, he said, enjoying his archness the more because he knew it would be meaningless to her. They just vanish away wherever I go. Mrs. Laristi looked at him suspiciously and sniffed. Edward said, now I think we'll have a look in this room opposite. He moved to the door on the opposite side of the hall, but once again, Mrs. Laristi and her troop of silent children sprang ahead of him 
and went through their weird and muddled ritual. Oh, Teddy, darling, I don't like this. It's so strange what they're doing. Don't take any notice of the silly old troll. She thinks going through all this corny mumbo-jumbo is going to frighten us off the house. Really, I ask you, it's too absurd for words. Makes you want to laugh out loud. Mrs. Laristi had stopped now and looked round at them with hostility, suspicious about their whispering. From her face it looked as though she thought they had been planning to murder her. What nice children you have, Mrs. Laristi, Penny said reassuringly. It must be so jolly, all being together in a group like that. So nice for playing. She produced a semblance of her social laugh, and Edward squeezed her hand in gratitude for the effort she had made. Mrs. Laristi looked at her children as though Penny had reminded her of an enemy. She turned on her children suddenly and began shouting at the youngest and hitting him for no apparent reason. The child immediately started to scream, and then one of the elder children began to attack its mother. She turned on it too with gusto until she had eventually subdued them both. Penny put her hand behind Edward's arm, and they watched with more disgust and embarrassment this flurry of near-animal turmoil. When it was over, Edward opened the door and strode firmly into the room. The light didn't work, and he had to use his torch. This room was completely bare and had only one casement window. It didn't run the whole length of the house like the room opposite. The air in it was damp and clammy and cold. There was a strange smell about that wasn't quite so recognizable this time. There was something more to it than just dirt and staleness and cats. Something familiar and rather disturbing, not quite drains or mustiness something else. What's that funny smell? Penny, darling? But Penny had taken out her little handkerchief, soaked in worth perfume she kept in her handbag, and was dabbing it to her nose, so presumably she had managed to avoid it altogether. Edward walked across the room, puzzling over the smell, listening to his feet echoing on the boards. He pulled absent-mindedly at a piece of peeled wallpaper, exposed by the steely finger of light from his torch, Still, the smell meant nothing to him. Now, upstairs, Mrs. Laristi said, pressing them with sudden vigor, many rooms upstairs. They trooped up the bare, shadowy stairs with pirouetted round to face a narrow landing. The landing was in complete darkness. Edward switched on his torch and swung it about. There seemed to be rather nice paneling in the form of a dado on both walls, although it was, of course, ruined at present by countless layers of horrible old paint. Possibly that might have saved it from the worm, though. That was a consoling thought worth remembering. Of course, he said to Penny in a strong conversational tone. You have to remember this area was something of a little health spa right outside the city of London when all these nice houses were built. That accounts for the expensive and tasteful workmanship. This house probably belonged to a rich merchant, probably his little showpiece in the country. It seems odd to think of it like that now, doesn't it? These rooms... Mrs. Laristi said, bad rooms, cold and not good. You wait for me, make it done for you, go in. She and her children then went into her ritual once again before she would let them into any of the rooms. Edward found his intense irritation that his common sense was being eroded slowly by the repetition of her muddled yet strangely disturbing performance. The inept support from her children added to its macabre effect now instead of making it more ridiculous as he had expected. He began to feel uneasy, and this made him furious with her and all the more determined to overcome the puerile weakness in him that was susceptible to such rubbish. The rooms he went into with Penny were not in so bad a state as those downstairs, though they too were suffering from long neglect. They were all completely empty and had obviously not even been entered, let alone used more than once or twice in decades. The ancient and filthy wallpaper had not been changed since Victorian times. There were thick layers of dirt on the pleasantly shaped windows, some of which had broken panes with pieces of wood tacked over them. The two rooms, which had been the principal bedrooms, had excellent ceilings in the same style as the downstairs main rooms, and really attractive fireplaces surround disfigured by chocolate paint. As far as he could tell from the beam of his torch, none of the lights was working, of course. There were no telltale signs of a leaky roof above the ceilings either. There's something eerie about these rooms, Penny muttered. They're so well deserted. It's as though as much living as ought to be done in them has been done already. They're, well, sort of empty tombs, aren't they? Oh, don't be silly, he said shortly. 
because something of the same feeling had come to him, simply as a result of the Laristi's repeated absurdities he knew very well. All houses are like this before anything's been done to them. You've got to look at them with what can be done in your mind, not just take them as they are. She didn't reply, and he knew that he had upset her, but he hardened himself against it. Everything he had seen so far had confirmed the potential of the place, and he damn well wasn't going to be jockeyed out of it by female pressure, even if pennies was being added to the Laristi woman's for the time being. He'd soon shake her out of that when he got her to the Roman room. Is evil, this house, Mrs. Laristi chose that moment to chip in again, watching him with her black eyes, which looked in the gloom of the landing like the source of all the darkness in the house. Sometimes, she said, there's terrible cries and shrieks. There's horror that frightens my little ones so they cannot sleep or eat for days. They sick for days. Oh, for God's sake, that's enough of this drivel. Edward burst out. We've had quite enough ignorance and folly for now. What kind of fools do you think we are? We're not taken in by that sort of thing, don't you see? If we like the house, we'll buy it, whatever you say, and we'll probably even give you a whole lot of money to find somewhere else to live. You'll like better. Now let us see the rest of it without any more fuss. Mrs. Laristi's face went wooden. Behind her, the small faces of her children watched him, their eyes glittering like rat's eyes in the shadows. Mrs. Laristi shrugged. You have seen all. Is no more to see. Oh, really? Edward said, regretting his outburst. Now is a sign of being rattled. Now listen, Mrs. Laristi. I know there's another room downstairs, which you deliberately avoided showing me. The room at the back, opposite side to the long living room. I shan't go until we've seen it. Now, come on. He led the way imperiously down the stairs, the beam of his torch, a sword blade, cutting the gloom aside. He could hear Penny's high heels following, then the multiple tramp of the Laristi horde. He strode straight to the door which he knew led to the room. Mrs. Laristi had kept from him. She jostled fiercely in front of him once again and put her revolting hands on his dark, crombie overcoat, pushing him away from the door. Oh, no, no, she shrieked. Is the evil room, the evil room. You must not go in for fear of death. Ah, Dios, Dios. To his surprise, Edward saw that she was genuinely her terrified now. Her face was as lifeless as dough, her black eyes bright with panic. This room is where big evil in the house is living. There is terrible sounds in this room. Always. Maybe old murder there. Maybe many murders. Maybe worse. There's terrible things come out at night to make evil in the house. Oh, Madre de Dios. Oh, Teddy, Penny's voice was thin as water. Let's leave it and go, please, please. Surely this one room doesn't matter now when we've seen so many. Nonsense, Edward almost shouted. Superstitious nonsense. I'm not surprised. There's a terrible noise with these revolting cats having the run of the place. For God's sake, let's behave like intelligent adults instead of a lot of sniveling savages. He gripped Penny's arm roughly to bring her to her senses and then swept Mrs. Laristi and her children aside with the hand in which he held his big torch. He pushed at the door, but it was locked. Fortunately, the woman had left the key in the lock. He turned it and flung the door open, pulling Penny firmly inside with him so that the beginning would not be over before there was time to think. He almost laughed with the pathos of it when he looked round in the room. It was big and harmless and empty. It was almost cheerful with the moonlight pouring in through the pleasing French windows that gave on to the long garden beyond. Of course, the garden was bound to be a wilderness now, but perhaps some good plants had survived and could be trimmed into shape again, and unsurprisingly, the glass in the French windows was mostly broken. The only sound was the voices of the Laristis gabbling away at their mumbo-jumbo outside, louder than ever because of her panic. The room was really very nice indeed, with perhaps the best ceiling of all, though the wallpaper was in ruins again. The only odd thing about it was the smell, which was once again very much the same smell as in the other adjoining room, which he'd been in at the beginning, and which had perplexed him then. He walked forward with Penny across the room, sniffing at the smell, knowing at the back of his mind that there was something important about it, while he played his torch on the intricacies of the ceiling. At that moment, a cat scuttled from a dark corner 
and out of the broken French window, and the floor cracked and gave way beneath them. Penny's thin, elastic scream coincided with the sensation of their falling, and then unconsciousness came and hit him like a giant fist. Agonizing pain in his legs brought him to he didn't know how long afterwards. At the same moment, the smell he had been worrying about the moment before the accident leaped forward to reveal itself in his mind. It was a vile smell of the hideous, insidious fungus that swallows houses alive like a python. It was Merulius lacrimans, dry rot. He tried to move, but the pain in his legs leaped, making him scream. He realized his trousers were warm and wet and that he was already faint from loss of blood. He groped with his hands and found he was lying on heaps of rubble and broken brick. They must have fallen through to some deep foundation beneath the house. Panic at the thought of Penny shot through him. He called her name and groped about in the darkness for her. His hand came in contact with the familiar softness of her cashmere coat. He sobbed with relief and grasped her for comfort in spite of the pain. But she didn't respond. When his fingers found her face, he knew why. Her head was right over, her neck broken. She was dead. Then the sound of the key turning in the lock in the door above somewhere, and the noise of the wristies gabbling their charms came to him dimly, showing him that he couldn't have been unconscious for long. He cried out for help, but the pain in the effort turned into a scream. The only answer was increased gabbling from the Laristes. It dawned on him suddenly that she would take their disappearance merely as the work of the evil she imagined to be in control of the room. Any cry she heard would only confirm in her mind that something awful had happened to them because of it. He knew for certain she'd do nothing about it. His thoughts flew to the estate agent, Faithwell. Surely he'd do something. But there was little hope of anything from an inefficient and listless fellow like that. He'd take the fact that they didn't contact him again as a sign that they weren't interested in the house, if he remembered them at all. And it was Friday night. Nobody would miss them until Monday at the earliest, when they'd see he hadn't turned up at the office. Tears sprang to his eyes, tears of fury at Mrs. Laristi, and the superstition that was now inevitably going to be the death of him too. He put his head on Penny's sweet-smelling cashmere coat and wept with fury and with weakness through the rapid loss of blood, which he did not know how to stop. The Dead Smile by F. Marion Crawford Sir Hugh Ockram smiled as he sat by the open window of his study in a late August afternoon, and just then a curiously yellow cloud obscured the low sun, and the clear summer light turned lurid as if it had been suddenly poisoned and polluted by the four vapors of a plague. Sir Hugh's face seemed at best to be made of fine parchments drawn skin tight over a wooden mask in which two eyes were sunk out of sight and peered from far within through crevices under the slanting, wrinkled lids, alive and watchful like two toads in their holes, side by side and exactly alike. But as the light changed, then a little yellow glare flashed in each. Nurse MacDonald said once that when Sir Hugh smiled, he saw the faces of two women in hell. Two dead women he had betrayed. Nurse MacDonald was a hundred years old and the smile widened, stretching the pale lips across the discolored teeth in an expression of profound self-satisfaction, blended with the most unforgiving hatred and contempt for the human doll. The hideous disease of which he was dying had touched his brain. His son stood beside him, tall, white, and delicate as an angel in a primitive picture, and though there was deep distress in his violet eyes as he looked at his father's face, he felt a shadow of that sickening smile stealing across his own lips, and parting them and drawing them against his will. And it was like a bad dream, for he tried not to smile and smiled the more. Beside him, strangely like him, in her wan, angelic beauty, with the same shadowy golden hair, the same sad violet eyes, the same luminously pale face, Evelyn Warburton, rested one hand upon his arm. And as she looked into her uncle's eyes and could not turn her own away, she knew that the deathly smile was hovering on her own red lips, drawing them tightly across her little teeth, while two bright tears ran down her cheeks to her mouth and dropped from the upper to the lower lips while she smiled. And the smile was like the shadow of death, 
and the seal of damnation upon her pure young face. Of course, said Sir Hugh very slowly, and still looking out at the trees. If you have made up your mind to be married, I cannot hinder you, and I don't suppose you attach the smallest importance to my consent. Father, exclaimed Gabriel reproachfully. No, I do not deceive myself, continued the old man, smiling terribly. You will marry when I am dead, though there is a very good reason why you had better not. Why you had better not, he repeated very emphatically, and he slowly turned his toad eyes upon the lovers. What reason? asked Evelyn in a frightened voice. Never mind the reason, my dear. You will marry just as if it did not exist. There was a long pause. Two gone, he said, his voice lowering strangely, and two more will be four. All together, forever and ever, burning, burning, burning bright. At the last words, his head sank back slowly, and the little glare of the toad eyes disappeared under the swollen lids, and the lurid cloud passed from the westering sun, so that the earth was green again, and the light pure. Sir Hugh had fallen asleep, as he often did in his last illness, even while speaking. Gabriel Ockram drew Evelyn away, and from the study they went out into the dim hall, softly closing the door behind them, and each audibly drew breath, as though some sudden danger had been passed. They laid their hands, each in the others, and their strangely alike eyes met in a long look, in which love and perfect understanding were darkened by the secret terror of an unknown thing. Their pale faces reflected each other's fear. It is his secret, said Evelyn at last. He will never tell us what it is. If he dies with it, answered Gabriel, let it be on his own head. On his head, echoed the dim hall. It was a strange echo, and some were frightened by it, for they said that if it were a real echo, it should repeat everything and not give back a phrase here and there, now speaking, now silent. But Nurse MacDonald said that the great hall would never echo a prayer when an Akram was about to die though it would give back curses ten for one. On his head it repeated quite softly, and Evelyn started and looked round. It is only the echo, said Gabriel, leading her away. They went out into the late afternoon light and sat upon a stone seat behind the chapel, which was built across the end of the east wing. It was very still, not a breath stirred, and there was no sound near them. Only far off in the park a songbird was whistling the high prelude to the evening chorus. It is very lonely here, said Evelyn, taking Gabriel's hand nervously and speaking as if she dreaded to disturb the silence. If it were dark, I should be afraid. Of what? Of me? Gabriel's sad eyes turned to her. Oh, no. How could I be afraid of you? But of the old Akrams. They say they are just under our feet here in the north vault outside the chapel, all in their shrouds with no coffins as they used to bury them as they will always will, as they will bury my father and me. They say an Akram will not lie in a coffin. But it cannot be true. These are fairy tales, ghost stories, Evelyn nestled nearer to her companion, grasping his hand more tightly, and the sun began to go down. Of course, but there is a story of old Sir Vernon, who was beheaded for treason under James II. The family brought his body back from the scaffold in an iron coffin, with heavy locks, and they put it in the north vault. But even afterwards, whenever the vault was opened to bury another of the family, they found the coffin wide open and the body standing upright against the wall, and the head rolled away in a corner, smiling at it. As Uncle Hugh smiles, Evelyn shivered. Yes, I suppose so, answered Gabriel thoughtfully. Of course, I never saw it, and the vault has not been open for thirty years. None of us have died since then. And if, if Uncle Hugh dies, shall you... Evelyn stopped, and her beautiful thin face was quite white. Yes, I shall see him laid there too, with his secret, whatever it is. Gabriel sighed and pressed the girl's little hand. I do not like to think of it, she said unsteadily. Oh, Gabriel, what can the secret be? He said we had better not marry, not that he forbade it, but he said it so strangely, and he smiled. Oh, 
Her small white teeth chattered with fear and she looked over her shoulder while drawing still closer to Gabriel. And somehow I felt it in my own face. So did I, answered Gabriel in a low nervous voice. Nurse MacDonald, he stopped abruptly. What? What did she say? Oh, nothing. She has told me things. They would frighten you, dear. Come, it is growing chilly. He rose, but Evelyn held his hand in both of hers, still sitting and looking up into his face. But well, we shall be married just the same, Gabriel. Say that we shall. Of course, darling, of course. But while my father is so very ill, it is impossible. Oh, Gabriel, Gabriel, dear, I wish we were married now, cried Evelyn in sudden distress. I know that something will prevent it and keep us apart. Nothing shall. Nothing? Nothing human, said Gabriel Ockram, as she drew him down to her, and their faces that were so strangely alike met and touched, and Gabriel knew that the kiss had a marvelous savor of evil, but on Evelyn's lips it was like a cool breath of a sweet and mortal fear, and neither understood, for they were innocent and young, yet she drew him to her by her slightest touch, as a sensitive plant shivers and weaves its thin leaves and bends and closes softly upon what it wants, and he let himself be drawn to her willingly, and he would, if touch her, had been deadly and poisonous, for she strangely loved that half-voluptuous breath of fear, and he passionately desired the nameless evil something that lurked in her maiden lips. It is as if we loved in a strange dream, she said. I fear the waking, he murmured. We shall not wake, dear. When the dream is over, it will have already turned into death, so softly that we shall not know it. But until then, she paused and her eyes sought his, and their faces slowly came nearer. It was as if they had thoughts in their red lips that foresaw and foreknew the deep kiss of each other. Until then, she said again very low, and her mouth was nearer to his. Dream, till then, murmured his breath. Nurse MacDonald was a hundred years old. She used to sleep sitting all bent together in the great old leathern armchair with wings, her feet in a bag full stool lined with sheepskin and many warm blankets wrapped about her even in summer. Beside her a little lamp always burned at night by an old silver cup in which there was something to drink. Her face was very wrinkled but the wrinkles were so small and fine and near together that they made shadows instead of lines. Two thin locks of hair that was turning from white to a smoky yellow again were drawn over her temples from under her starched white cap. Every now and then she woke and her eyelids were drawn up in tiny folds like little pink silk curtains and her queer blue eyes looked straight before her through doors and walls and worlds to a far place beyond. Then she slept again in her hands lay one upon the other on the edge of the blanket. The thumbs had grown longer than the fingers with the age, and the joints shone in the low lamplight like polished crab apples. It was nearly one o'clock in the night, and the summer breeze was blowing the ivy branch against the panes of the window with a hushing caress. In the small room beyond, with the door ajar, the girl maid who took care of Nurse MacDonald's was fast asleep. All was very quiet. The old woman breathed regularly, and her indrawn lips trembled each time as the breath went out and her eyes were shut. But outside the closed window there was a face, and violet eyes were looking steadily at the ancient sleeper, for it was like the face of Evelyn Warburton, though they were eighty feet from the sill of the window to the foot of the tower. Yet the cheeks were thinner than Evelyn's, and as white as a gleam and her eyes stared, and the lips were not red with life. They were dead and painted with new blood. Slowly Nurse MacDonald's wrinkled eyelids folded themselves back, and she looked straight at the face at the window while one might count ten. Is it time, she asked, in her little old faraway voice. While she looked, the face at the window changed, for the eyes opened wider and wider till the white glared all around the bright violet and the bloody lips opened over gleaming teeth and stretched and widened and stretched again and the shadow golden hair rose and streamed against the window in the night breeze and in answer to nurse macdonald's questions came the sound that freezes 
the living flesh. That low moaning voice that rises suddenly like the scream of storm, from a moan to a wail, from a wail to a howl, from a howl to the fear shriek of the tortured dead. He who had heard knows, and he can bear witness that the cry of the banshee is an evil cry to hear alone in the deep night. When it was over and the face was gone, Nurse MacDonald shook a little in her great chair, as still she looked at the black square of the window, but there was nothing more there, nothing but the night and the whispering ivy branch. She turned her head to the door that was ajar, and there stood the girl in her white gown, her teeth chattering with fright. It is time, child, said Nurse MacDonald. I must go to him, for it is the end. She rose slowly, leaning her withered hands upon the arms of the chair, and the girl brought her a woolen gown and a great mantle and her crutch stick and made her ready. But very often the girl looked at the window and was unjointed with fear, and often Nurse MacDonald shook her head and said words which the maid could not understand. It was like the face of Miss Evelyn, said the girl at last, trembling. But the ancient woman looked up sharply and angrily, and her queer blue eyes blared. She held herself by the arm of the great chair with her left hand and lifted up her crutch stick to strike the maid with all her might, but she did not. You are a good girl, she said, but you are a fool. Pray for wit, child, pray for wit, or else find service in another house than Ockram Hall. Bring the lamp and help me under my left arm. The crutch stick clacked on the wooden floor, and the low heels of the woman's slippers clappered after her in slow triplets as Nurse MacDonald got towards the door, and down the stairs each step she took was a labor in itself, and by the clacking noise the waking servants knew that she was coming very long before they saw her. No one was sleeping now, and there were lights and whisperings and pale faces in the corridors near Sir Hugh's bedroom, and now someone went in, and now someone came out, but everyone made way for Nurse MacDonald, who had nursed Sir Hugh's father more than eighty years ago. The light was soft and clear in the room. There stood Gabriel Ockram by his father's bedside, and there knelt Evelyn Warburton, her hair lying like a golden shadow down her shoulders, and her hands clasped nervously together. And opposite Gabriel and Nurse was trying to make Sir Hugh drink, but he would not, and though his lips were parted, his teeth were set. He was very, very thin and yellow now, and his eyes caught the light sideways and were as yellow coals. Do not torment him, said Nurse MacDonald to the woman who held the cup. Let me speak to him, for his hour has come. Let her speak to him, said Gabriel in a dull voice. So the ancient woman leaned to the pillow and laid the featherweight of her withered hand that was like a brown moth upon Sir Hugh's yellow fingers. And she spoke to him earnestly, while only Gabriel and Evelyn were left in the room to hear. Hugh Ockram, she said, this is the end of your life, and as I saw you born, and saw your father born before you. I am come to see you die, you Ockram. Will you tell me the truth? The dying man recognized the little faraway voice he had known all his life, and he very slowly turned his yellow face to Nurse MacDonald, but he said nothing. Then she spoke again. You Ockram, you will never see the daylight again. Will you tell the truth? His toad-like eyes were not dull yet. They fastened themselves on her face. What do you want of me, he asked, and each word struck hollow on the last. I have no secrets. I have lived a good life. Nurse MacDonald laughed, a tiny cracked laugh that made her old head bob and tremble a little, as if her neck were on a steel spring. But Sir Hugh's eyes grew red and his pale lips began to twist. Let me die in peace, he said slowly. But Nurse MacDonald shook her head, and her brown moth-like hand left his and fluttered to his forehead. By the mother that bore you and died of grief for the sins you did, tell me the truth. Sir Hugh's lips tightened on his discolored teeth. Not on earth, he answered slowly. By the wife who bore your son and died heartbroken, tell me the truth. Neither to you in life, nor to her in eternal death. His lips writhed as if the words were coals between them, and a great drop of sweat rolled down the parchment of his forehead. Gabriel Ockram bit his hand as he watched his father die, 
But Nurse MacDonald spoke a third time. By the woman whom you betrayed, who waits for you this night. You, Akram, tell me the truth. It is too late. Let me die in peace. The writhing lips began to smile across the set yellow teeth, and the toad eyes glowed like evil jewels in his head. There is time, said the agent woman. Tell me the name of Evelyn Warburton's father. Then I will let you die in peace. Evelyn started back, kneeling as she was, and stared at Nurse MacDonald, and then at her uncle. The name of Evelyn's father, he repeated slowly, while the awful smile spread upon his dying face. The light was growing strangely dim in the great room. As Evelyn looked, Nurse MacDonald's crooked shadow on the wall grew gigantic. Sir Hugh's breath came thick, rattling in his throat, as death crept in like a snake and choked it back. Evelyn prayed aloud, high and clear. Then something rapped at the window, and she felt her hair rise upon her head in a cool breeze as she looked around in spite of herself. And when she saw her own white face looking in at the window and her own eyes staring at her through the glass, wide and fearful, and her own hair streaming against the pane, and her own lips dashed with blood, she rose slowly from the floor and stood rigid for one moment, till she screamed once and fell back into Gabriel's arms. But the shriek that answered hers was the fierce shriek of the tormented corpse, out of which the soul cannot pass. For shame of deadly sins, though the devils fight in it with corruption, each for their due share. Sir Hugh Ockram sat upright in his deathbed and saw and cried aloud, Evelyn! His harsh voice broke and rattled in his chest as he sank down, but still Nurse MacDonald tortured him, for there was a little life left in him still. You have seen the mother, as she waits for you, you Ockram. Who was this girl, Evelyn's father? What was his name? For the last time the dreadful smile came upon the twisted lips, very slowly, very surely now, and the toad eyes glared red, and the parchment face glowed a little in the flickering light, for the last time words came. They know it in hell. Then the glowing eyes went out quickly. The yellow face turned wax and pale, and a great shiver ran through the thin body as Hugh Ockram died. But in death he still smiled, for he knew his secret and kept it still on the other side, and he would take it with him to lie with him forever in the north vault of the chapel, where the Ockrams lie uncoffined in their shrouds, all but one. Though he was dead, he smiled, for he had kept his treasure of evil truth to the end, and there was none left to tell the name he had spoken, but there was all the evil he had not undone left to bear fruit. As they watched, Nurse MacDonald and Gabriel, who held Evelyn still unconscious in his arms while he looked at the father, they felt the dead smile crawling along their own lips, the ancient crone and the youth with the angel's face. Then they shivered a little and both looked at Evelyn as she lay with her head on his shoulder. And though she was very beautiful, the same sickening smile was twisting her mouth too, and it was like the foreshadowing of a great evil which they could not understand. But by and by they carried Evelyn out, and she opened her eyes, and the smile was gone. From far away in the great house the sound of weeping and crooning came up the stairs and echoed along the dismal corridors, for the women had begun to mourn the dead master after the Irish fashion and the hall had echoes of its own all that night, like the far-off wail of the banshee among the forest trees. When the time was come, they took Sir Hugh in his winding sheet on a trestle bier, and bore him to the chapel, and through the iron door and down the long descent to the north vault with tapers to lay him by his father, and two men went in first to prepare the place and came back staggering like drunken men, and white leaving their lights behind them. But Gabriel Ockram was not afraid, for he knew. And he went in alone and saw that the body of Sir Vernon Ockram was leaning upright against the stone wall, and that his head lay on the ground nearby, with the face turned up, and the dried leathern lips smiled horribly at the dried-up corpse, while the iron coffin lined with black velvet stood open on the floor. Then Gabriel took the thing in his hands, for it was very light, being quite dried by the air of the vault, 
and those who peeped in from the door saw him laid in the coffin again, and it rustled a little like a bundle of reeds, and sounded hollow as it touched the sides and the bottom. He also placed the head upon the shoulders and shut down the lid, which fell to with a rusty spring that snapped. After that they laid Sir Hugh beside his father, with a trestle beer on which they had brought him, and they went back to the chapel. But when they saw one another's faces, master and men, they were all smiling with the dead smile of the corpse they had left in the vault so that they could not bear to look at one another until it had faded away. Gabriel Ockham became Sir Gabriel, inheriting the baronetcy with a half-ruined fortune left by his father, and still Evelyn Warburton lived at Ockram Hall, in the south room that had been hers ever since she could remember anything. She could not go away, for there were no relatives to whom she could have gone, and besides there seemed to be no reason why she should not stay. The world would never trouble itself to care what the Ockrams did on their Irish estates, as it was long since the Ockrams had asked anything of the world. So Sir Gabriel took his father's place at the dark old table in the dining room, and Evelyn sat opposite to him, until such time as their mourning should be over, and they might be married at last. And meanwhile their lives went on as before, since Sir Hugh had been a hopeless invalid during the last year of his life, and they had seen him but once a day for the little while, spending most of their time together in a strangely perfect companionship. But though the late summer saddened into autumn, and autumn darkened into winter, and storm followed storm, and rain poured on rain through the short days and the long nights, yet Ockram Hall seemed less gloomy since Sir Hugh had been laid in the north vault beside his father. And at Christmas tide, Evelyn decked the great hall with holly and green bows, and huge fires blazed on every hearth. Then the tenants were all bidden to a New Year's dinner, and they ate and drank well, while Sir Gabriel sat at the head of the table. Evelyn came in when the port wine was brought, and the most respected of the tenants made a speech to propose your health. It was long, he said, since there had been a Lady Ockram. Sir Gabriel shaded his eyes with his hand and looked down at the table, but a faint color came into Evelyn's transparent cheeks. But, said the gray-haired farmer, it was longer still since there had been a lady of Ockram so fair as the next was to be, and he gave the health of Evelyn Warburton. Then the tenants all stood up and shouted for her, and Sir Gabriel stood up likewise beside Evelyn, and when the men gave the last and loudest cheer of all, there was a voice not theirs, above them all higher, fiercer, louder, a scream not earthly, shrieking for the bride of Ockram Hall, and the holly and the green bows over the great chimney piece shook and slowly waved as if a cool breeze were blowing over them. But the men turned very pale, and many of them sat down their glasses, but others let them fall upon the floor for fear. And looking into one another's faces, they were all smiling strangely, a dead smile, like a dead Sir Hughes. One cried out in words in Irish, and the fear of death was suddenly upon them all, so that they fled in panic, falling over one another like wild beasts in the burning forest, when the thick smoke runs along the flame and the tables were overset, and drinking glasses and bottles were broken in heaps and the dark red wine crawled like blood upon the polished floor. Sir Gabriel and Evelyn stood alone at the head of the table before the wreck of the feast not daring to turn to each other, for each knew that the other smiled. But his right arm held her and his left hand clasped her right as they stared before them, and before the shadows of her hair one might not have told their two faces apart. They listened long, but the cry came not again, and the dead smile faded from their lips, while each remembered that Sir Hugh Ockram lay in the north vault, smiling in his winding sheet, in the dark, because he had died with his secret. So ended the tenants' New Year's dinner. But from that time on, Sir Gabriel grew more and more silent, and his face grew even paler and thinner than before. Often without warning and without words, he would rise from his seat, as if something moved him against his will and he would go out into the rain or the sunshine to the north side of the chapel and sit on the stone bench staring at the ground as if he could see through it and through the vault below and through the white winding sheet in the dark to the dead smile that would not die. Always when he went down that way, Evelyn came up presently and sat beside him. Once too, as in summer, their beautiful faces came suddenly near and their lids drooped and their red lips were almost joined together. But as their eyes met, 
They grew wild and wide, so that the white showed in a ring all around the deep violet, and their teeth chattered, and their hands were like hands of corpses, each in the others for the terror of what was under their feet, and of what they knew but could not see. Once also Evelyn found Sir Gabriel in the chapel alone, standing before the iron door that led down to the place of death, and in his hand there was the key to the door, but he had not put it in the lock. Evelyn drew him away, shivering, for she had also been driven in waking dreams to see that terrible thing again, and to find out whether it had changed since it had lain there. "'I'm going mad, sir,' said Gabriel, covering his eyes with his hand as he went with her. "'I see it in my sleep. I see it when I'm awake. It draws me to it day and night, and unless I see it I shall die.' "'I know,' answered Evelyn. "'I know.' It is as if threads were spun from it like a spider's drawing us down to it. She was silent for a moment, and then she stared violently and grasped his arm with a man's strength, and almost screamed the words she spoke. But we must not go there, she cried. We must not go. Sir Gabriel's eyes were half shut, and he was not moved by the agony on her face. I shall die unless I see it again, he said in a quiet voice, not like his own. And all that day and that evening he scarcely spoke, thinking of it, always thinking, while Evelyn Warburton quivered from head to foot with a terror she had never known. She went alone on a grey winter's morning to Nurse MacDonald's room in the tower, and sat down beside the great leathern easy chair, laying her thin white hand upon the withered fingers. Nurse, she said, what was it that Uncle Hugh should have told you that night before he died? It must have been an awful secret, and yet... Though you asked him, I feel somehow that you know it, and that you know why he used to smile so dreadfully. The old woman's head moved slowly from side to side. I only guess I shall never know, she answered slowly in her cracked little voice. But what do you guess? Who am I? Why did you ask who my father was? You know I am Colonel Warburton's daughter, and my mother was Lady Ockram's sister, so that Gabriel and I are cousins. My father was killed in Afghanistan. What secret can there be? I do not know. I can only guess. Guess what? asked Evelyn imploringly, and pressing the soft withered hands as she leaned forward. But Nurse MacDonald's wrinkled lids dropped suddenly over her queer blue eyes, and their lips shook a little with her breath as if she were asleep. Evelyn waited. By the fire, the Irish maid was knitting fast, and the needles clicked like three or four clocks ticking against each other, and the real clock on the wall solemnly ticked alone, checking off the sounds of the woman who was a hundred years old and had not many days left. Outside, the ivy branch beat the window in the wintry blast as it had beaten against the glass a hundred years ago. Then as Evelyn sat there, she felt again the waking of a horrible desire. The sickening wish to go down, down to the thing in the north vault, and to open the winding sheet and see whether it had changed, and she held Nurse MacDonald's hand as if to keep herself in her place and fight against the appalling attraction of the evil dead. But the old cat that kept Nurse MacDonald's feet warm, lying always on the bag footstool, got up and stretched itself, and looked up into Evelyn's eyes while its back arched, and its tail thickened and bristled and its ugly pink lips drew back in a devilish grin, showing its sharp teeth. Evelyn stared at it, half fascinated by its ugliness. Then the creature suddenly put one paw with all its claws spread and spat at the girl, and all at once the grinning cat was like the smiling corpse far down below, so that Evelyn shivered down to her small feet and covered her face with her free hand, lest Nurse MacDonald should awake and see the dead smile there for she could feel it. The old woman had already opened her eyes again, and she touched her cat with the end of her crutch stick, whereupon its back went down and its tail shrunk, and it sidled back to its place in the back footstool. But its yellow eyes looked up sideways at Evelyn between the slits of its lids. What is it that you guess, nurse? asked the young girl again. A bad thing. A wicked thing. But I dare not tell you, lest it might not be true and the very thought should blast your life. For if I guess right, he meant that you should not know, and that you should too should marry and pay for his old sin with your soul. He used to tell us that we ought not to marry. Yes, 
He told you that, perhaps, but it was as if a man put poisoned meat before a starving beast and said, Do not eat, but never raised his hand to take the meat away. And if he told you that you should not marry, it was because he hoped you would. For of all men living or dead, you, Akram, was the falsest man that ever told a cowardly lie, and the cruelest that ever hurt a weak woman, and the worst that ever loved to sin. But Gabriel and I love each other, said Evelyn very sadly. Nurse MacDonald's old eyes looked far away, at sight seen long ago, and that rose in the grey winter air amid the mist of an ancient youth. If you love, you can die together, she said very slowly. Why should you live if it is true? I'm a hundred years old. What has life given me? The beginning is fire, the end is a heap of ashes, and in between the end and the beginning lies all the pain in the world. Let me sleep since I cannot die. Then the old woman's eyes closed again, and her head sank a little lower upon her breast. So Evelyn went away and left her sleep with a cat asleep on the bag footstool, and the young girl tried to forget. Nurse MacDonald's words, but she could not, for she heard them over and over again in the wind and behind her on the stairs, and as she grew sick with fear of the frightful unknown evil to which her soul was bound, she felt a bodily something pressing her and pushing her and forcing her on, and from the other side she felt the threads that drew her mysteriously, and when she shut her eyes, she saw in the chapel behind the altar the low iron door through which she must pass to go to the thing. And as she lay awake at night, she drew the sheet over her face, lest she should see shadows on the wall beckoning her, and the sound of her own warm breath made whisperings in her ears, while she held the mattress with her hands, to keep from getting up and going to the chapel. She would have been easier if there had not been a way hither, through the library, by a door which was never locked. It would be fearfully easy to take her candle and go softly through the sleeping house, and the key of the vault lay under the altar behind a stone that turned. She knew the little secret. She could go alone and see, but when she thought of it, she felt her hair rise in her head, and first she shivered so that the bed shook, and then the horror went through her in a cold thrill that was agony again, like myriads of icy needles boring into her nerves. The old clock in Nurse MacDonald's tower struck midnight. From her room she could hear the creaking chains and weights in their boxes in the corner of the staircase, and overhead the jarring of the rusty lever that lifted the hammer. She had heard it all her life. It struck eleven strokes clearly, and then came the twelfth, with a dull half-stroke as though the hammer were too weary to go on, and had fallen asleep against the bell. The old cat got up from the bag footstool and stretched itself, and Nurse MacDonald opened her ancient eyes and looked slowly round the room by the dim light of the night lamp. She touched the cat with her crutch stick and it lay down upon her feet. She drank a few drops from her cup and went to sleep again. But downstairs Sir Gabriel sat straight up as the clock struck, for he had dreamed a fearful dream of horror. His heart stood still, till he awoke at its stopping and it beat again furiously with his breath like a wild thing set free. No Ockram had ever known fear waking, but sometimes it came to Sir Gabriel in his sleep. He pressed his hands on his temples as he sat up in bed, and his hands were icy cold, but his head was hot. The dream faded far, and in its place there came the sick twisting of his lips in the dark that would have been a smile. Far off, Evelyn Warburton dreamed that the dead smile was on her mouth, and awoke, starting with a little moan, her face in her hands, shivering. But Sir Gabriel struck a light and got up and began to walk up and down his great room. It was midnight, and he had barely slept an hour, and in the north of Ireland the winter nights are long. I shall go mad, he said to himself, holding his forehead. He knew that it was true. For weeks and months the possession of the thing had grown upon him like a disease, though he could think of nothing without thinking first of that. And now all at once it outgrew his strength, and he knew that he must be its instrument or lose his mind, that he must do the deed he hated and feared. If he could fear anything, or that something would snap in his brain and divide him from life while he was yet alive. He took the candlestick in his hand, the old-fashioned heavy candlestick that had always been used by the head of the house. He did not think of dressing but when as he was, in his silk night clothes and his slippers, and he opened the door, 
Everything was very still in the great old house. He shut the door behind him and walked noiselessly on the carpet through the long corridor. A cool breeze blew over his shoulder and blew the flame of his candle straight out from him. Instinctively he stopped and looked around, but all was still, and the upright flame burned reed steadily. He walked on, and instantly a strong draught was behind him, almost extinguishing the light. It seemed to blow him on his way, ceasing whenever he turned, coming again when he went on. Invisible, icy. Down the great staircase to the echoing hall he went, seeing nothing but the flame of the candle standing away from him over the guttering wax, while the cold wind blew over his shoulder and through his hair. On he passed through the open door into the library, dark with old books and carved bookcases. On through the door in the shelves with painted shelves on it and the imitated backs of books, so that one needed to know where to find it, and it shut itself after him with a soft click. He entered the low arch passage, and though the door was shut behind him and fitted tightly in its frame, still the cold breeze blew the flame forward as he walked. And he was not afraid, but his face was very pale and his eyes were wide and bright, looking before him, seeing already in the dark air the picture of the thing beyond. But in the chapel he stood still, his hand on the little turning stone tablet in the back of the stone altar. On the tablet were engraved words in Latin which read, The key to the vault of the most illustrious lord of Ockram. Sir Gabriel paused and listened. He fancied that he heard a sound far off in the great house, where all had been so still, but it did not come again. Yet he waited at the last and looked at the low iron door. Beyond it, down the long descent, lay his father, uncoffined, six months dead, corrupt, terrible in his clinging shroud. The strangely preserving air of the vault could not have yet done its work completely. But on the thing's ghastly features, with their half-dried, open eyes, there would still be the frightful smile with which the man had died, the smile that haunted. As the thought crossed Sir Gabriel's mind, he felt his lips writhing, and he struck his own mouth in wrath with the back of his hand so fiercely that a drop of blood ran down his chin, and another and more falling back in the gloom upon the chapel pavement. But still his bruised lips twisted themselves. He turned a tablet by the simple secret. It needed no safer fastening, for had each ochrum been confined in pure gold, and had the door been wide, there was no man in Tyrone brave enough to go down to the place, saving Gabriel Ockram himself with his angel's face and his thin white hands and his sad, unflinching eyes. He took the great gold key and set it into the lock of the iron door, and the heavy, rattling noise echoed down the descent beyond like footsteps, as if a watcher had stood behind the iron and were running away within with heavy dead feet. And though he was standing still, the cool wind was from behind him and blew the flame of the candle against the iron panel. He turned the key. Sir Gabriel saw that his candle was short. There were new ones on the altar with long candlesticks, and he lit one, and he left his own burning on the floor. As he set it down on the pavement, his lips began to bleed again, and another drop fell upon the stones. He drew the iron door open and pushed it back against the chapel wall so that it would not shut of itself while he was within and the horrible draught of the sepulchre came out of the depths in his face foul and dark he went in but though the fetid air met him yet the flame of the tall candle was blown straight from him against the wind while he walked down the easy incline with steady steps his loose slippers slapping the pavement as he trod he shaded the candle with his hand and his fingers seemed to be made of wax and blood as the light shone through them and in spite of him the unearthly draught forced the flame forward till it was blue over the black wick, and it seemed as if it must go out. But he went straight on, with shining eyes. The downward passage was wide, and he could not always see the walls by the struggling light, but he knew when he was in the place of death by the larger, drearer echo of his steps in the greater space, and by the sensation of a distant blank wall. He stood still, almost enclosing the flame of the candle in the hollow of his hand. He could see a little, for his eyes were glowing, used to the gloom. Shadowy forms were outlined in the dimness, where the beers of the Ockram stood crowded together, side by side, each with its straight shrouded corpse, strangely preserved by the dry air like the empty shell that the locust sheds in summer. And a few steps before him he saw clearly the dark shape of headless Sir Vernon's iron coffin, and he knew that nearest to it lay the thing he sought. 
He was as brave as any of those dead men had been, and they were his father's. And he knew that sooner or later he should lie there himself beside Sir Hugh, slowly drying to a parchment shell. But he was still alive, and he closed his eyes the moment, and three great drops stood on his forehead. Then he looked again, and by the whiteness of the winding sheet he knew his father's corpse, for all the others were brown with age, and moreover the flame of the candle was blown towards it. He made four steps till he reached it, and suddenly the light burned straight and high, shedding a dazzling yellow glare upon the fine linen that was all white, save over the face, and where the joined hands were laid on the breast, and at those places ugly stains had spread, darkened with outlines of the features and of the tight clasped fingers. There was a frightful stench of drying death. As Sir Gabriel looked down, something stirred behind him. Softly at first, then more noisily, and something fell to the stone floor with a dull thud and rolled up to his feet. He started back and saw withered head lying almost face upward on the pavement, grinning at him. He felt the cold sweat standing on his face, and his heart beat painfully. For the first time in all his life, that evil thing which men call fear was getting hold of him, checking his heartstrings as a cool driver for checks a quivering horse clawing at his backbone with icy hands, lifting his hair with freezing breath, climbing up, and gathering in his midriff with leaden weight. Yet presently he bit his lip and bent down, holding the candle in one hand to lift his shroud back from the head of the corpse with the other. Slowly he lifted it. Then it clove to the half-dried skin of the face, and his hand shook as if someone had struck him on the elbow. But half in fear and half in anger at himself, he pulled it so that it came away with a little ripping sound. He caught his breath as he held it, not yet throwing it back and not yet looking. The horror was working in him, and he felt that old Vernon Ockram was standing up in his iron coffin, headless yet watching him with a stump of his severed neck. While he held his breath, he felt the dead smile twisting his lips. In sudden wrath at his own misery, he tossed the death-stained linen backwards and looked at last. He ground his teeth lest he should shriek aloud. There it was the thing that haunted him, that haunted Evelyn Warburton, that was like a blight on all that came near him. The dead face was blotched with dark stains, and the thin gray hair was matted about the discolored forehead. The sunken lids were half open, and the candlelight gleamed on something foul where the toad eyes had lived. But yet the dead thing smiled, as it had smiled in life. The ghastly lips were parted and drawn wide and tight upon the wolfish teeth cursing still and still defying hell to do its worst, defying, cursing, and always and forever smiling alone in the dark. Sir Gabriel opened the winding sheet where the hands were, and the black and withered fingers were closed upon something stained and mottled. Shivering from head to foot, but fighting like a man in agony for his life, he tried to take the package from the dead man's hold, but as he pulled at it the claw-like fingers seemed to close more tightly, and when he pulled harder the shrunken hands and arms rose from the corpse with a horrible look of life following his motion. Then as he wrenched the sealed packet loose at last, the hands fell back into their place still folded. He set down the candle on the edge of the bier to break the seals from the stop paper, and kneeling on one knee to get a better light, he read what was within, written long ago in Sir Hugh's queer hand. He was no longer afraid. He read how Sir Hugh had written it all down that it might perchance be a witness of evil, and of his hatred, how he had loved Evelyn Warburton, his wife's sister, and now his wife had died of a broken heart with his curse upon her, and how Warburton and he had fought side by side in Afghanistan, and Warburton had fallen, but Akram had brought his comrade's wife back a full year later, and little Evelyn, her child, had been born in Akram Hall, and next, how he had wearied of the mother, and she had died like her sister with his curse on her, and then how Evelyn had been brought up as his niece, and how he had trusted that his son Gabriel and his daughter, innocent and unknowing, might love and marry, and the souls of the women he had betrayed might suffer another anguish before eternity was out. And last of all, he hoped that some day, when nothing could be undone, the two might find his writing and live on, not daring to tell the truth for their children's sake and the world's word, man and wife. 
This he read, kneeling beside the corpse in the north vault by the light of the altar candle. And when he had read it all, he thanked God aloud that he had found the secret in time. But when he rose to his feet and looked down at the dead face, it was changed, and the smile was gone from it forever, and the jaw had fallen a little, and the tired dead lips were relaxed. And then there was a breath behind him and close to him, not cold like that which had blown the flame of the candles he came, but warm and human, he turned suddenly. There she stood, all in white, with her shadowy golden hair, for she had risen from her bed and had followed him noiselessly, and had found him reading and had herself read over his shoulder. He started violently when he saw her, for his nerves were unstrung, and then he cried out her name and the still place of death. Evelyn, my brother, she answered softly and tenderly, putting out both hands to meet his.